what's going on guys Johnny Ben here at Trepid Technologies and in today's video we're gonna go over the WAN architectures that need to be covered in the CCNA and a few bonus things so in this CCNA exam objective we gotta understand some of our key WAN architectures so because of this we have to now learn things like MPLS dedicated lease line DSL cat V different types of commercial offerings we also will have to get into SD-WAN because that is part of now the WAN architectures especially from Cisco's offerings now if you actually look at the CCNA exam objectives none of those technologies are actually written out but it's kind of just doing nobody any favors if you're going to go out and say you're CCNA certified and not understand how your enterprise could potentially connect off to an ISP connect off to the internet and the technologies have going on in the background especially when it comes to like MPLS which again is still common and also, different types of lease lines, serial connections, the difference between Cat5 and Fiber as far as it goes, as far as connecting off to the ISP. A lot of the times, if you're getting an Ethernet connection to an ISP, it's actually going to be a fiber line. So, we're going to get into that. We need the different types of WAN architectures and also just basic internet connections. So, when I go out and I get a, an office somewhere, a small business, I'm just going to probably get regular connection that I would get at my house. Or maybe I'll pay extra for the small business, but it's going to be a broadband connection. Whether or not your local ISP has fiber or whether or not it's just a simple cable that's still connecting off to a broadband connection, connecting off to the ISP. Well, I don't want to just send my information insecurely to the internet, just to the ISP. Especially now as we grow as a company, maybe we have a headquarters office, a couple spoke offices, and we're still just connecting off to the fiber in our ISP. Maybe we now have the business package, but maybe we don't want to spend on MPLS. Well, if we're going to connect our spoke and hub offices, then we're going to have to introduce something like VPNs, actually protecting our traffic destined to the internet. And then as we expand, maybe we want to have a regular broadband connection and then some redundancy. Maybe we'll have a 5G connection at a spoke office along with the local ISP. Maybe at the HQ. Maybe we do have a dedicated lease line to an ISP that does MPLS. And then we also have the local fiber connection to our ISP. And maybe as just a contingency, we do have 5G at that headquarters office. Well, now how do we combine all those different forms of transport into a single pane of glass that we can manage? Now we get into SD-WAN and software-defined networking, which... I'm not, I don't have a slide right now to go over, but we will talk about it because that is part of the way in architecture we've got to think of, especially any network engineer nowadays. If you're working even for Home Depot, Lowe's, for fast food chains, you're going to be using some form of SD-WAN, kind of moving, shifting away from MPLS, those dedicated lease lines. But we have to learn all three. We still got to understand all types of WAN architectures, especially as a CCNA working in the enterprise. We're, we're not expected to know exactly what the service provider's network is, has going on. We're not going to get into uh, MPLS traffic engineering tunnels. You know, we're not going to do that in the CCNA. What we will do is just talk about how MPLS label switching works. We are going to talk about how we connect our enterprise to the ISP because that is something you may do as a network admin or as a network engineer uh, working in the enterprise. So with that being said, let me go ahead and now hide my face and let's actually get in to the lecture so we're gonna go over WAN architectures here and on the agenda we're gonna go over just a quick overview of what the WAN is what it stands for right what a wide area network is the different types of WAN links this is gonna be pretty in-depth and then we're gonna go over WAN redundancy and then more than likely just from these three big bullet points we're probably gonna come up on 30 minutes worth of content and we'll probably save the VPN section for another video okay even though it's all one slide deck, we'll just guessing here, we're probably going to have to save VPNs for another video. All right, so WAN overview. So it stands for Wide Area Networks. These connect to geographically dispersed locations. It utilizes public or private communication links to interconnect sites. And you can think of this public as just that broadband, broadband ISP or internet connection, and private being those dedicated leased lines okay or like mpls and then when an, a wan or wide area network enables the sharing of data applications and resources across a large geographic area so i have my 
office here in Arizona. That's where I live. Connect it off. And then I have my headquarters office in New York. This is a WAN connection. However, these get connected, whether it's a VPN tunnel, whether it's MPLS, whether it's an actual dedicated T1 line, that is a wide area network that's connecting geographically dispersed LANs. Because remember, connected to that AZ router, connected to that New York router, is going to be an, uh, an office with users in a local area network that needs to get access to the other local area network all the way across the country or globally, just depending on what kind of environment you're in. So WANs typically operate over long distances and may involve multiple service providers. So in the same vein, if in Arizona, I'm connected off to my ISP, we have Cox, and I need to connect off to my headquarters office in New York, and who knows what they have there. Maybe it's Spectrum, maybe it's Verizon, we'll just, maybe it's AT&T, let's just say that. Now, these ISPs have to be connected in order for these two offices to connect. Now, again, that's getting into the service provider technology with autonomous systems, BGP routing, that we don't need to get into. But WAN connections provide connectivity for remote offices, branches, and the data centers. So maybe in this New York office, we also have an on-prem data center that's hosting all of our domain and enterprise resources that users in AZ have to connect to. Like maybe Office 365, on-prem hybrid deployment, maybe a SharePoint portal, the local uh, or the internal website that they use. So to dive right into it, the first thing we're going to go over is leased lines. So leased lines are dedicated private communication lines between two locations. Now this could be over like, uh, it's mainly copper, right? It's probably going to be copper lines and they offer high reliability with consistent bandwidth. Now why is that? Because lease lines are not shared. If you're getting the lease line, that means you have like 24 channels is what they call it, especially with these, T, with these T1 speeds, 24 channels that belong to you and nobody else. No one else shares that lease line. That's how it's supposed to be, right? So they provide consistent bandwidth that are ideal for businesses with consistent data transfer speeds. So again, we used to see this a lot back in the early 2000s and we still see it, but uh, with companies that had to do a lot of transactions, right? A lot of credit card, debit card transactions. And the reason that is, is because they needed consistent bandwidth. They didn't care about their users having uh, any cloud-based uh, uh, applications they needed to access that require a lot of bandwidth and throughput because they didn't have any, right? Mainly, it might've just been a couple phones and then your ATM machines and then your point of sale system. So they had lease lines. And lease lines in America come in these T-speeds. So T1 being 1.544 megabits per second. The next one is T3, and I, off the top of my head, I can't remember. If you want to look it up, there's, I'm sure it's on Google. Uh, but those are the speeds in America, the T-speeds. In Europe, we have E-speeds. I think E1 is like 2.48 megabits per second, and then E3 is like, I think 44. Again, I can't remember off the top of my head, but that's what a lease line is. It's not any shared segment or any shared Ethernet segment within an ISP. And then we have Ethernet WAN connections. So now we're talking about in the service provider network, we're connecting off to businesses and they all share the connection. Well, excuse me, they all share the service provider network. And this ethernet connection typically is going to be fiber. So imagine you have a fiber line ran into your house and all everyone on the block has that same fiber line. Well, they all connect off to the service provider network where then in the, net, the ISP network, they may be running NPLS or whatever. That's not what we're concerned about. At this edge here, this customer edge, all we're concerned about is that we have a connection off to the ISP, that this interface is getting an IP address, and that everything else is transparent. From here, we know we're connected off to the internet, to our ISP, and that's it. We don't care about this provider edge router here, this PE router, because if it goes down, it's not on us. This would be something called our demarcation point. Once we're connected off to the ISP, beyond this connection here, it's no longer our issue. So Ethernet WAN connections offer high bandwidth, flexibility, and scalability for connecting geographically dispersed locations. And again, with this service provider network, we could potentially get access to our spoke office here, or we have this hub that's connecting all three. And now if Phoenix wants to talk to LA, it may go through that hub and back down. 
Now let's get into something called MPLS. So MPLS is a little different and this is in our service provider network. So MPLS is something called label switching. So it stands for multi-protocol label switching. And I'll write that out since I don't have it on my slides. Multi-protocol label switching. And with MPLS, we actually get a virtual private network within the service provider that sections off and encapsulates our traffic when we're connected to the service provider with a label. And then that label is going to be switched throughout the, her the whole service provider network. So with label switching, MPLS operates by adding a short label to the beginning of each data packet's header. This label determines the path the packet will take through the network, enabling faster and more deterministic forwarding. So essentially what we're saying here is that if these are all our offices and we're all connected to the service provider, the same service provider network, instead of us creating like VPN, GRE tunnels here, we can use MPLS connections through the service provider that we can ask them for that says, hey, make sure that my Phoenix office and my Denver office are directly connected to each other. So again, we have our CE routers here that are connected to these PE routers. And to these two routers here that belong to us, this whole service provider network might as well be just one big switch because it's transparent to them. All we know is that now we're going to have a direct connection. So with layer two MPLS, we're going to have direct peering connection to these CE routers here. With layer three MPLS, there'll be a PE router here, a PE router here, and the CE routers will peer to the PE routers, and then they peer to each other. Again, creating that simulated direct connection, but now that's layer three in PLS, where we're adding the label after the IP address, the layer three header, okay? And again, this is, uh, it can be very complicated in PLS. We have traffic engineering, um, it creates VPNs. We have layer three MPLS VPNs. We have layer two MPLS. For CCNA, I just want you to understand that it's a way uh, to forward packets, not using IP addresses, but by actually adding an MPLS switching label within a service provider network. That's pretty much the gist of what you need to know. So more information about MPLS traffic engineering. MPLS allows network administrators to control the flow of traffic by assigning specific paths and priorities to different types of data. Then it also provides VPNs. So MPLS is widely used in creating secure and scalable VPNs. MPLS VPNs enable the separation of customer traffic within that service provider network. So it lets you isolate your enterprise's traffic within the service provider, providing essentially a VPN using MPLS labels and tags. MPLS can also support quality of service mechanisms. So MPLS uses what's called label switch routers, which are responsible for forwarding labeled packets. The path that labeled packets traverse through the network is called the label switch path. So within the ISP, we have these LSRs, the label switch routers, that are actually going to send the traffic. Then we have label distribution protocol. LDP is used to exchange label information between MPLS enabled routers, ensuring that each label switch router knows how to forward labeled packets correctly. So within our LSRs, when we send our MPLS traffic, we use the label distribution protocol. And if you ever get into the CCMP uh, Encore exam or certification, you're gonna be learning a lot more about these different, these MPLS protocols. And then if you take a look down here, one more thing to kind of just hit home what MPLS is. It is for the service provider. MPLS is within that service provider network with all its different routers and connections to forward traffic deterministically, right? Having that label switched path. So when we as an enterprise are having all of our spoke offices, right? Or setting up offices and we tell the service provider, hey, we want to have MPLS connections to all of our different offices. So simulating direct connections, right? Layer two, layer three, MPLS VPNs. How we connect to the ISP doesn't matter. It's all transparent to the ISP because once we connect, then we get put, we, an MPLS label gets put on our traffic and now it isolates us within that ISP. 
So we could be connected to the ISP via fiber, via that broadband cable connection, 5G, or this serial connection here, which uses HDLC or PPP encapsulation, which isn't even Ethernet, right? As long as we have MPLS connections here with our traffic labeled and isolated, we can have direct connections to each other through that MPLS label switched path in the source provider network. Whew, okay. MPLS is always uh, kind of a doozy to talk about when we're not actually getting into configuration and diving deep into it, doing these wire chart captures, but that's okay. You just need to understand the basics of it for the CCNA exam. All right, so now let's go over cable TV connections. So this is gonna be what you see in your house if you don't have fiber. So we have these already ran cable lines that go into our house and the service provider is gonna give us a modem. And that modem is going to modulate and demodulate the analog signals coming across that cable line. It's going to demodulate them and put them into digital, into binary. And then when we need to send traffic out, it's going to modulate them back into analog, into those electrical signals going over that copper line back to the service provider. That's how our cable lines work. So this modem separates internet traffic from your regular television traffic if you still pay for cable. I'm in Gen Z. We don't pay for cable, I think, at all. We just use streaming services, right? So even for me at my house, I have a cable connection just to my modem, and that's it. And then I'm running Ubiquiti routers into that modem, okay? So sometimes this modem and router can be combined, or you can have your home router connect off to that modem here, and that's still going to be pretty much the entry and exit point for that cable TV connection, for that cat V connection. All right, last thing we're gonna go over in this slide deck is going to be redundant connections. Actually, we only have 17 minutes, so we'll probably just finish up. So redundant connections, when we're working in the enterprise, we have a saying that two is one and one is none. So we always have to have redundancy within our enterprise, and we have some terms for that. So single home, that means there's one connection to one ISP. This is gonna be very typical for Soho connections. So that's small office, home office connections. So I'm working from home and I, I'm just, I'm running my business. I just need a single connection to ISP. There's gonna be no reason for me to be always connected. Maybe when I teach virtual classes, that's when I'll start thinking about redundant connections, but you also got to think about price, right? In the business operations. Do we need a single or two connections for our business operations? Something you have to think about. Multi-homed. That's where we still have one router on our end or one routing device. But we have two connections to an ISP. So what that would look like is my Ubiquiti router being connected to maybe a Starlink terminal and then also be connected to my local ISP. If I have that, where's my single point of failure? It's still at this single router. If my Ubiquiti router goes down, I could have 10 different ISP connections. It won't matter. That is multi-homed. One connection or one device to two different ISPs from a single router. And then we have dual-homed. This is where we have two routers. And now both those routers have one connection off to the ISP. So this does give us local redundancy. And then from here, we could do like a... Uh, an FHRP protocol like HSRP, hot standby routing protocol. And now we have that redundancy back to our LAN as far as anything we can control. So now we can deploy two routers. However, if we're off to one ISP and that ISP comes down, then we're pretty much boned. And you actually you saw this, I think this happened about a year or two ago on the East Coast where a lot of businesses had their resources hosted on AWS East or Amazon East, and that data center went down, and it didn't matter how many connections they had back to the AWS East, how many VPC connections they had, they came down. That is the danger of dual home. Locally, what you can control, you're good, but the dis and end you can't control, if it goes down, you're down. And then we have probably the best redundancy we can have without adding in more ISPs, more routers, and that's dual multi-home. That's where we have two routers, 
with two connections off to two different ISPs. Where can we see this happening? Where do we have a use case for this, guys? Pretty much if we always need uptime. If we're a critical task is 100% uptime, maybe we make our money purely based on e-commerce, where we need our customers always have access to our site, we can have a dual multi-home. And this is a great use case for SD-WAN, where we can control from a single pane of glass these two routers' connections, okay? All right, now moving on to VPNs. So now we're gonna get into when we're connected off to the internet, how do we protect our connections? So internet VPNs, also known as virtual private network, leverage the public internet infrastructure to establish secure encrypted connections between remote locations or users, providing a cost-effective solution for secure data transmission. So if we think about the days of old, if we wanted what looked like a direct connection between our office in Arizona and LA, what did we have to do? We had to get a leased line. And that could cost a lot of money. Well, now with the VPNs, we can still simulate that direct connection, but we could be connected off to an ISP with a maybe a $69 broadband connection that gives us 400 megs down. I mean, that's pretty solid, okay, for 69 bucks. And we can implement VPNs to protect our data traversing the internet, traversing that ISP. So tunneling. VPNs create tunnels within the public internet, encapsulating data packets in that layer three header to prevent unauthorized access. VPN protocols. We have a bunch of different types of internet VPNs that we can use. We have IPsec, which is mainly gonna be used for site to site. We have SSL and TLS VPNs, which will be mainly used for remote access so that one-off user using like Cisco or AnyConnect on their actual uh, computer. And then we have different types of protocols like point-to-point -point tunneling protocol, which could be like a layer two, PPTP. And each different protocol has specific characteristics and use cases. It really just depends on your business use case and solution, okay? What kind of VPN you're gonna deploy. A lot of this has to go into cost effectiveness and the type of enterprise you have. If you work for Apple, like if you're a direct Apple employee, where they have a strict coming to the office, well, you're probably not investing a lot into remote access VPNs on a user's computer because again, you work from the office. So you probably have a lot of network engineers that are used to building site-to-site -site VPNs between all the Apple's offices and probably their like uh, retail stores. And that would be the use case for that. All right. So now let's go over the difference between site-to-site -site and remote access VPNs. So site-to-site -site VPNs are created and used for enterprises with multiple offices. And what do we mean by that? So essentially, let's say we have our HQ here connected off to an ISP, and this is in Arizona. And now we want to get an office on the East Coast, so we move to Boston. So we have our spoke office in Boston. Well, now we're probably gonna think about site to site, right? Because at our HQ, we might have like an on-prem data center that our new employees over here need to connect to. So instead of having like 50 different users with remote access VPNs on their actual client devices, well, what we're gonna do is just connect those two routers in a VPN. And now the users from both these offices have direct connections to each other while also allowing regular internet connection to still probably go out that ISP. And we're going to get into that. Or we could configure it that, hey, every single spoke office, you're going to send all traffic to our HQ site. It's going to go through our data center firewalls and then back out to the ISP, okay? So site-to-site -site VPNs are typically configured on stationary network infrastructure. So here's all the different types of site-to-site -site VPN infrastructure we could have, we could have a router to router, router to firewall, router to a dedicated VPN concentrator, firewall to firewall, firewall to VPN concentrator. So as long as we have a network device that can do like an IPsec VPN or site-to-site -site VPN, that's all we need to connect. I use site-to-site -site between my home and my office for Trepid Technologies on my Ubiquiti routers because it's so easy. But then I also have remote access VPNs using WireGuard installed on my actual devices that also connect off to my office. So now let's go over that. 
So remote access VPNs are typically used and configured for enterprises with remote users or mobile infrastructure. So if you have a BYOD policy, you have a mobile fleet, as I like to call it, of users that need to get access to your enterprise resources, typically that's where remote access VPNs come in. And those are typically going to use TLS as the encryption method. So this client connects off to the internet, but it also needs access to our enterprise. So we could have a VPN endpoint here that allows all these clients to connect off to. And now this client, depending on the configuration, can either have a full tunnel back to that HQ and to that office, or it can have a split tunnel. Well, when it needs to access enterprise resources, it uses the VPN. If it needs to get to the internet, it just uses its regular internet connection. And this allows our users, if we have remote users, to work from anywhere and gives them really that freedom of movement, right? They can work while camping, connected to Starlink with the remote access VPN. They can be connected at the local coffee shop with remote access VPNs. So that's our two major categories here, guys, that we're going to talk about. Site to site and remote access. Now to dive in to what site to site is a little bit further. So site to site VPNs connect two or more geographically separated networks. It establishes a private encrypted tunnel over the internet and enables seamless communication and resource sharing between sites. Keyword here, sites. So as we can see with site to site VPNs and multiple offices, we're typically going to have this type of architecture, a hub and spoke. Okay. So this could be something like DMVPN. This could be like FlexVPN. This could be GetVPN for Cisco, depending you know, on your devices. Or we could really have this kind of architecture with SD-WAN. SD-WAN also uses uh, VPN and IPsec over their uh, devices, over their SD-WAN client or customer edge devices, okay? All right. So site to site VPNs, we're going to use technologies like IPsec to secure these tunnels between our sites and our routers. Okay, so again, IPsec VPN in Cisco. So Cisco uses the internet protocol, secu internet protocol security to provide secure encrypted tunnels between Cisco devices for site to site, and sometimes it can be used for remote access VPNs. So the components of IPsec are two major ones. One, it's going to be the Internet Key Exchange Protocol for secure key exchange, and then the encapsulating security protocol for the actual data encryption and authentication. So we're going to have two major, two modes with IPsec. We have tunnel mode and transport mode when we configure IPsec. So with tunnel mode, we're actually encrypting the IP header and encapsulating it with a new VPN header, and we're encrypting the data. But with transport mode, we just encrypt that data, and then we still have that original IP header exposed, but we have our new VPN header that's connecting us between sites through the internet, right? We need that VPN header to connect our VPN endpoints. So with tunnel mode, obviously we're gonna be more secure here, okay? Because we're encapsulating that layer three header and our actual data payload, okay? So, here we can kind of go a little bit deeper. So without IPsec, let's just say we had a GRE tunnel, or let's just say we had a, a regular connection, right? This is what it looked like. We'd have our layer three header and then our data. And then of course we'd have like our layer two over here, but we're worried about our IP header and beyond. With transport mode, to dive a little bit deeper into it, we have our ESP header or encapsulation security payload, and then our IP header out here. So really all this provides is just encrypting the data and authentication here with the ESP header and the ability to create a VPN, but our IP header is still exposed, okay? With tunnel mode, we get encryption for our data and our IP header, and then we get authentication all the way up to the ESP header, and then our new IP header, which is going to be our VPN and our IPsec IPs that connect the sites together. So we always kind of want to use tunnel mode here because it's better protection. And then we have GRE. So GRE VPNs in Cisco. So Cisco uses GRE to create virtual point-to-point -point connection between sites, but it's unsecure. So why would we want to do this? So GRE is a tunneling protocol 
uh, that en can encapsulate various protocols and it allows multicast, okay? With IPsec, a pure IPsec site to site VPN tunnel, multicast is not allowed. But with GRE, it is. So it gives us a lot more flexibility, okay? GRE, we have multi tunnel protocols as well. And it's the basis for something like DMVPN uh, with that generic route encapsulation. Now, DMVPN is its own thing, but you get the point. It kind of was like the predecessor, our GRE tunnels. So we have a lot of routing flexibility with GRE VPNs. They support dynamic routing protocols because those dynamic routing protocols share their hellos using what? Multicast. So with just a pure IPsec VPN, we couldn't route our LANs via OSPF or ERGRP, but with GRE, we can. So how do we protect GRE? Well, since GRE offers no encryption, we can do IPsec in conjunction with GRE. So we can do GRE over IPsec, okay? That's what it's called. So we can build a GRE tunnel on our Cisco routers here. This is Cisco devices. This is a CCNA class. And then encrypt it using IPsec. Okay, so that's a common solution you'll see. And then, of course, we have DMVPN I've been talking about. So Cisco's DMVPN is a scalable VPN solution that allows direct secure communication between multiple sites without requiring a direct permanent connection between them. So how does this differ than what we've been talking about? So DMVPN has a true hub-and-spoke architecture where the hub is the central VPN server and the spokes are the remote sites. However... We can build dynamic tunnels. So if we do like phase two or phase three with DMVPN, these spokes using the next top resolution protocol, that's a protocol within DMVPN, can actually create direct connections between each other without having to go to hub and back to spoke, okay? Now again, not a part of our CCNA uh, exam objectives. So we're not gonna talk about it too much. Now. VPN remote access. So remote access VPNs in Cisco. So here, this is where we're gonna use like SSL and TLS technologies. Obviously TLS is what we're gonna use because that's actually secure, SSL being antiquated. But this allows the remote worker to connect off to any internet connection, doesn't matter. They can be at their house, at a coffee shop, and allows them to connect to our enterprise resources here. So that remote worker if they want to do work, let's say at 9 p.m. at night, all of a sudden they want to upload maybe a, a presentation, they can turn on their VPN, get access to our enterprise here, and they can access the file shares, maybe the SharePoint portal. So this provides that remote access VPN from anywhere without requiring an actual router and site-to-site -site connection. A lot more flexible. Other things it provides is user authentication, so Cisco Remote Access VPN support various authentication methods, including your username and password. So we can actually do an LDAP sync, right? We can make sure you're using your ADUC credentials. We can do digital certificates, multi-factor authentication. So we can also set up your phone that says, hey, put in this code to get access, right? To make sure that we're actually protecting. Because let's say this laptop gets stolen, and then that malicious actor who stole the laptop activates the VPN, and you just automatically authenticate well guess what now that hacker malicious threat actor has full access to our enterprise so it provides us a way to do further authentication the last thing we're going to go over is something called split tunnel and full tunnel so what we just talked about is all the different vpn solutions but one thing we didn't talk about is how traffic that's not destined for our enterprise gets treated so we have two different ways we can configure our VPNs. And this doesn't matter if it's remote access or site to site, we can configure them two different ways, as a split tunnel or a full tunnel. With a split tunnel, traffic destined for the enterprise, meaning if this user here, let's say it's remote access, needs to access an enterprise resource at 192.168.100.15, it's gonna go through the VPN. But let's say now that that user goes on YouTube to listen to some lo-fi while he or she is working. It's gonna go out the regular ISP connection that it's connected to, okay? That's a split tunnel, and that's truly more efficient and less resource intensive on that VPN concentrator sitting at your enterprise network or your data center or your HQ. Now with full tunnel, 
It doesn't matter what the traffic is destined for. It's always going to go through our enterprise. And then once it reaches the enterprise, it's going to determine where to send that traffic. So if you're destined for YouTube, it's going to go out its ISP connection back to YouTube and back and then through that full tunnel again, back to you. Okay, so that's gonna be it for our WAN architecture slides. I wanna thank everyone for viewing, and remember, if you're an active duty National Guard or Reserve soldier, you get 4,000 a year for credentialing assistance, where you can come to one of our courses and go to our live virtual training CCNA, and you get actual live instruction for free. And this can be done for any certification you want. That's what you're entitled to as a soldier. So I want to thank everyone for viewing. And if you like this video, please like and subscribe and share with your friends.